Every morning of the summer, a team of marine biologists heads out into Simpson Bay, one of the remote inlets of Alaska's Prince William Sound. They are part of the longest running field research on sea otter behavior. What's it doing? Resting. Classic otter. Our crew has traveled some 1,500 miles to Alaska to catch a glimpse of otters in the wild. That's because there aren't any otters along the Oregon coast. There used to be. So the question is, why aren't there any otters? And will there ever be otters again? Today, there is only one spot on the entire Oregon coast to watch sea otters, and there are only three of them, Nuka, Schuster, and Oswald. We are always training our otters something new to keep them mentally stimulated. They're always trying to think two steps ahead of me, and so I have to think five steps ahead of them. <laughs> Target. Good. Specialists like Brittany interact with the otters every day. Yep. Part of the morning routine is to coax the otters onto scales to monitor their weight. In doing so, they've come to learn what these otters need to stay healthy. And it happens to be something that Oregon has in abundance. So we have some butter clam and squid, shrimp. Every morning, Brittany and her team prepare the otters breakfast. So he's eating about 15 pounds of food every single day, all restaurant quality seafood. So that ends up costing us about $22,000 a year just to feed one of our sea otters. Under Brittany's care, the three otters of the Oregon Coast Aquarium seem pretty content with their buckets of seafood. But it seems like there'd be plenty of food for them to eat out in the ocean. So if not for a lack of food, why are there no otters on the Oregon coast? Here in Simpson Bay, the otters crack open clams or feast on strands of kelp where fish have laid delicious roe. The otters eat about 25% of their body weight in seafood every day. They need to eat so much to stay warm in the icy water. But all of these calories aren't going into a thick layer of fat. Most marine mammals rely on blubber for insulation. Sea otters are the only marine mammal that relies exclusively on fur. Sea otters have about the same body temperature as us and would quickly go hypothermic in the frigid Pacific water, if not for a unique adaptation when you see otters out here grooming, what we think they're doing is felting their fur. The very fine underhairs, as they're grooming them, they become very, very tightly intertwined until the spaces between the hairs are so fine that water cannot penetrate. And that's how they maintain an air layer next to their skin. Their fur is the key to their survival in the cold water, but it almost led to their demise. It was their luxurious pelts that brought top dollar during the era of the fur trade. Sea otters once thrived from the Aleutian Islands to Baja, but they had been hunted to near extinction during the fur trade. Oregon's last wild sea otter was killed in 1906. Sea otters no longer occurred in anywhere outside the Aleutians or Prince William Sound, Alaska. None in Washington, none in Oregon, none in British Columbia, they were gone. But a handful of otters survived in some of the most remote pockets of Alaska. These otters in Simpson Bay are descendants of the original wild otters. But then, at the height of the Cold War, the otters faced an unexpected threat. In the late 1960s, the Atomic Energy Commission decided to test some nuclear devices on the Aleutian Islands. Three, two, one. Plans to test nuclear bombs in Alaska prompted an urgency to round up some of the last wild otters and relocate them along their former range. Wildlife biologists came up from Oregon to help with the effort. These men prepare to launch the most, most ambitious transplant experiment to date. Unfortunately, many otters drowned in the nets. And more died in transit. The surviving otters were then taken to the small fishing town of Port Orford and boated out into the Pacific. Well, the otters were 
out of their minds by the time they were towed that far, and they had to practically force them to get out of the pens. It wasn't at all what we would call a passive release. You know, they didn't know. This, a lot of this was all groundbreaking stuff. Despite the hard lessons learned, the relocation project seemed to have gotten at least enough otters to Oregon for a start. Rahan was a graduate student at Oregon State University at the time and signed up to monitor Oregon's new sea otters. In the first few seasons, Ron spotted babies. When I found those first pups, man, I was really excited. I said, this is going to happen. But then Ron began to notice fewer and fewer otters. After only 11 years, the otters had disappeared completely. For the second time in history, Oregon lost its sea otters. People say things like, well, maybe they were all shot or something. And I don't think that was an issue. I think they just left. I really do. <laughs> But what's confusing is that the otter relocations to Washington and British Columbia worked. So what is it about Oregon's coastline beneath the surface that can explain the absence of otters? Graduate student Dominique Cohn is using the latest technology to find out. We can see that within this Port Orford area, we have relatively shallow depths, some kelp, and the location of Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve, which could potentially increase sea otter reestablishment. Dominique's maps are based on computer modeling. So he goes to the shoreline to confirm if there's indeed good habitat that could support otters. Now what's interesting about sea otters is that they eat several different species of prey, but by far they prefer to consume urchins because they are not a very mobile species, which means that they're fairly easy to catch. The abundance of urchins in the Port Orford area indicates that the habitat might be good for the otters, and the otters, in turn, might be good for the ocean habitat. And it has to do with the relationship between otters, urchins, and kelp. Kelp forests once grew thick here, but the kelp has been grazed down by sea urchins. We know that when you have high densities of sea otters, they can consume and drastically reduce urchin densities, what that does is that alleviates a lot of the urchins grazing and browsing pressure on the kelp, and that allows the kelp to grow more abundantly. Now what's interesting is that when you get more kelp, that provides habitat for a whole suite of other species. And so it's thought that when we bring sea otters back into the ecosystem, they can improve the overall health of the ecosystem. Our understanding on their ecology and natural behavior have really come a long ways over the last 50 years. But even though we know a lot about them now, but we really need to start answering some of these questions if we are gonna help managers make that decision on whether to bring them back. If nothing is done to bring back otters by human power, scientists say they may slowly swim southwards to Oregon on their own. But this could be years, decades, or maybe never. Oh, I'd, I'd love to come over here and look out behind me like I did that one time and see, you know, a little raft of sea otters. I'm afraid it's not going to happen in my lifetime. Unless we bring them back. <laughs>